women went missing in the Kansas City suburbs in the summer of 1989, and they are still missing decades later. Their assailant refuses to reveal where they are buried. Everyone has heard of Kansas's BTK killer, but few have heard of another prolific serial killer who terrorized the state in the late 1980s. Over the course of a month near the Kansas City border, at least six women were murdered by the same man. Four were kidnapped or killed in their homes. There was no evidence of forced entry. The killer was eventually apprehended by police while on vacation on South Padre Island in Texas. He was on his way to meet a young woman when he was arrested. He had a kill kit in his trunk, and even more disturbing, an investigation into this young murderer's background revealed that he committed his first murder before the age of 18. Things were tense in the Kansas City area for a few weeks during the summer of 1989. Three young women were missing and a man named Richard Grissom, 28, was on the run from the authorities. The crimes occurred near Overland Park, Kansas. Items from the victims were found near an abandoned farmhouse in the area. The three women vanished over a month, causing panic throughout the state. Each woman was kidnapped from her apartment. When it became clear that a repeat offender was on the loose, an intensive search operation was launched. Helicopters searched the area at all hours of the day and night for Grissom and the missing women. The police investigation left an indelible mark on the locals. The case remains in public consciousness in the Kansas City area. At first glance, Richard Grissom appeared to be the type of guy a woman would enjoy getting to know. He was attractive, charming, and charismatic. A detective later described him as a Don Juan with an athletic build. Grissom had a dark past of which most people were unaware. When Grissom was only 16, he murdered an older woman in Lansing, Kansas. The crime was particularly heinous. Grissom tied 72-year-old Hazel Meeker to a chair and stabbed her with a railroad spike. Police quickly apprehended Grissom after following footprints in the snow, leading away from the crime scene. He was sent to the Kansas Juvenile Detention Facility for three years before being released in 1980 at age 19. Let us go to the summer of 1989. Grissom was 28 and owned a painting and maintenance business in Kansas City. He was also on parole having been released from prison just the summer before for robbery and theft. Grissom, like many con men, could talk his way into or out of almost any situation, and he had several aliases. His new job of painting and doing maintenance was calculated. It provided him with access to master keys and apartment complexes throughout Kansas City. John Butler went out for a night on the town in Kansas City on June the 18th, 1989, before returning to her apartment in suburban Overland Park. Butler, 24, was never seen again. Butler's ATM card was used to make several withdrawals at various banks in the area. In the early morning hours of June the 19th, her rental car had also vanished. Butler's disappearance perplexed both her family and the police. On June the 25th, a week after her disappearance, Butler's rental car was found in Lawrence, Kansas, about 35 miles from Overland Park. A Lawrence police officer kept a close eye on the vehicle until a man approached and opened the trunk. Richard Grissom was the man in question. When the officer asked for identification, 
Grissom bolted, escaping the officer. Grissom's prints were all over the car, and he had forgotten to take his billfold and checkbook with him. Police also discovered a drop of John Butler's blood in the trunk of the car. Grissom was on the run now. He arranged for a ride back to Kansas City from a friend, and two more women vanished. 22-year-old roommates, Teresa Brown, and Christine Roosh. Brown and Roosh shared an apartment in Lenexa, Kansas, where Grissom had done some work. Brown and Roosh's bank accounts were cleaned out, as in the John Butler case. A haunting security camera image showed Roosh who was disheveled, wearing sunglasses, and had a large bruise on her forehead, withdrawing money from an ATM. It was the last time any of the missing women would be seen. Grissom was quickly determined to be involved in both of these disappearances. Two days later, a maintenance worker of an apartment complex in Grandview, Missouri, just across the state line, noticed someone lurking beneath the stairwell. It was Grissom, and when the worker approached him, he fled. Grissom left his car in the parking lot of the apartment while attempting to get away quickly. Police searched the vehicle and discovered evidence linking Grissom to the missing women, including identification and keys. There were five fake birth certificates and an official government seals in the car. A massive search was launched throughout the Kansas City area for Grissom and the women, but they were never found. Police knew they were up against an experienced career criminal based on Grissom's violent past and his cunning nature. There had been no sign of Grissom or the missing women for nearly two weeks. Then, on July the 7th, Grissom was arrested at the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport in Texas. He was supposed to meet a young woman from his past at the airport that day, but she tipped off the police, resulting in Grissom's arrest. The police of Kansas City breathed a sigh of relief, but one question remained. Where were Joan Butler, Teresa Brown, and Christine Roosh? During his interrogation, Grissom provided hazy answers about the women. He told the officers they are not dead, but later added, well, they're probably dead by now. You'll dig them up, Grissom told interrogators. Everything happened in Kansas, and nothing would be found in Missouri, he added. Grissom was aware that Missouri had the death penalty, whereas Kansas did not at the time. The man who prosecuted Grissom, Paul Morrison, described the killer as the type who could sell ice to Eskimos. Grissom eventually admitted there were no actual details. Authorities searched farmland and woods throughout Kansas City, even draining ponds, in hopes of finding the missing women. Butler, Brown, and Roosh were never found. Richard Grissom was tried for the women's murders in the fall of 1990. The first murder trial in Johnson County history to occur without a body. Despite the missing bodies, the mountain of evidence led to Grissom's conviction and a life sentence. He is now 62 and will spend the rest of his life in prison. The Grissom shack has long since been demolished and replaced by new apartment buildings. But the memory of Richard Grissom and his victims, Joan Butler, Teresa Brown, and Christine Roosh, looms large for those who lived in Kansas City in 1989. I'm afraid in this story, the bodies of these young women will never be found. You see, Grissom would not agree to tell them where the bodies were unless they gave him a plea bargain. But this time, police were very smart. Most of the time when killers ask for plea bargains in order to tell them where the bodies are, it's given 
that usually shave off many years off their sentences. But this time, they had so much evidence, they told him no. So he stubbornly will never tell where the bodies are. Have you ever heard of this case? Tell me what you think in the comments.